sources and data creditors. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's kind of these are all legit concerns. I mean, they're they're real. Any other uh, risks that come to mind? Concerns come to mind? Like false information. Mm -hmm. Luckier. <laughs> <laughs> right. So true. I mean, I wish those episodes weren't all so damn prescient. Um, okay, on the benefit side, on the op, on the opportunity side, what what comes to mind? No wrong answers, right? What comes to mind? Opportunities and benefits. Save time. Save time. Reduce uh, geographic boundaries. Hmm. Reduce geographic boundaries. <laughs> yes. Um, to reduce like paperwork and bureaucracy. Reducing paperwork and bureaucracy. Okay, I love that. Other ideas on the benefits? Maximize resources. Maximize. <laughs> Can you flesh that out a little more? What maximize resource? What kind of resources are you thinking about? Um, I'm thinking about kind of work and energy people put into the field, being able to offset a smaller field to kind of gauge a better picture of a bigger um, space for me. It's interesting. Yeah. Are there other benefits that come to mind? Other opportunities or benefits from these? So we're going, to, we're going to flesh this out more, of course. And you said that it came up with also maximizing um, physical resources and then allocating them so that there was less waste. And, you know, one of the complexities with this question is that, as we're going to talk about, there are many, many flavors of AI, right? And I'm not a computer scientist. I'm, I, I, I'm using these tools in various ways. And so that's that's my orientation, kind of worldview here. But there are many different flavors of these tools, but they boil down to some similar, some very basic concepts and unifying themes that I think we can understand, we can demystify. Um, but it also helps us understand the risks and the biases. So these are all good ideas. Now, who's doing what with AI in your conservation work now? Just is any what to what level or what in what ways are you guys using? AI tools. Anyway. Anybody using these things on a regular basis or has experience using? Yes. I have an example that I'm loosely affiliated with at Penn State University. Uh -huh. We're using an AI tool that's GIS based mm -hmm. to look at aerial imagery to understand historic BMP. Oh, that's interesting. Imagery, right? That's that is a fundamental theme when we think about the space where AI is quote unquote good imagery and we're going to talk about why that is but yes let's put a pin in that right so yes an idea back here sometimes i there's a, a paragraph or something that's just really confusingly worded uh -huh. like, how do you say this in simpler terms and it, in chat gpt4 others mm -hmm. oh, who's you use chat gpt4 or gpt3 or whatever four a couple folks okay cool we're gonna do a demo here to kind of look at how that how that can serve you or maybe not. <laughs> it goes both ways, right? Um, yeah. Oh, I, in a really simple example, I used it in Wix to generate a website. On, on so did you use a chat function to generate the code? Wix just has an AI function. Okay. And I just, it, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't doing it as a coding. Okay. <laughs> well, you, one, one thing you can do with these kind of chat tools is to say, write this R code, write this Python code, and brrr, it writes the code. So if you're in programming or coding, that is a game changer, right? But it's also kind of creepy because computers are now like building computers that build, like, you know, it's like, <laughs> what's happening here? Cyborg, right? Uh, other folks using these tools in a way? Okay, yes? I've used the, uh, like the new Photoshop beta AI tool. Okay, and what, what what's the functionality about? Um, How's it different? essentially just highlight different portions and type of prompts to add different, I mean, remove objects, but also you can add mountains, add water, which is pretty incredible. Okay. It's not like yet perfect. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. There are other, other hand back here. Yes. Oh, I use ChatGPT for like uh, ArcGIS to give you really specific error codes. And right. And sometimes you can copy and paste them in and it gives you in simple terms what exactly the error is. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a little bit more helpful than what the language they give you on how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So we heard about imagery. We heard about uh, chat GPT functions for, for text. Those are re referenced large language models. You know, in, in the research field, like some people are saying now that all statistical analysis, all e ecological, but any kind of scientific endeavor will begin with a large language model, which is kind of crazy when you think about that kind of like revolutionary scientific methods just everywhere. It's, it's kind of hard to fathom. But all these methods, so imagery is a big, is a big uh, common denominator. And one of the reasons why imagery is such an important part of the AI space is because computers do better with pictures than with other forms of data. In fact, there's some examples I'm gonna show you where you take you know, sound data, turn it into an image, analyze the image. The imagery data, the sort of pixelated imagery data are very uh, conducive for uh, computers. So that's how, why you see a lot of the, the, the imagery being a central focus. So BNP perspectives of like overhead views, um, that's, that's an interesting application. And there's a whole bunch of others, one of which I'm leading right now, and I'm going to try to entice you to get involved with, but imagery is the key, is the common denominator. Okay, so that kind of, that helps me kind of get a, a sense of the lay of the land. And so here's what we're going to do today. Talk about terms, get some terminology, demystifying AI. We're going to talk about some math concepts. Uh, some examples of AI and conservation. Maybe this could, you know, generate some thinking about where this could go. I'm going to talk about Trout Spotter. That's the tool I'm developing. And I'll entice you to get involved, do some demos, talk about some cautionary tales, and send you with some resources. Okay, so terminology. There's a bunch of words out here. What do we mean? AI. So, you know, people tend, tend to think about this as a, a, the, the, the menu of AI options. It's a little dis. I don't think this is actually the most accurate way to think about it, but you know, you tend to say like computer vision, neural networks, machine learning, deep learning. And we're not going to talk about all these natural language processing. These are the large language models in the chat <laughs> space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, machine learning has been around since the seventies, right? Machine learning is not in, necessarily a new AI concept, right? It's, it's the same thing as basically taking a huge array of data, randomizing it, fitting it, looking at the, 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 Variance explained, randomizing it again, fitting it, looking at the variance explained, and then optimizing it. And this has been around since the 70s. So that's not what's new. What's new is this, the neural networks concept. This is the fundamental unifying mathematical principle for all of this stuff, neural networks. So it's important to get a basic understand, understanding of this. And I want to show you like five minutes of this super powerful demystifier, neural networks. This is under the hood of everything that AI does, most everything that AI does. So check this out. It may not be audible. We're going to try it. If it's not audible, we're just going to ditch it. I'm going to play just a little bit of this, just a couple minutes of it, but it's an important concept. It's sloppily written and rendered at an extremely low resolution of 28 by 28 pixels. But your brain has Can no trouble that? recognizing it as a tree. And I want you to take a moment to appreciate how crazy it is that brains can do this so effortlessly. I mean, this, this, and this are also recognizable as trees, even though the specific values of each pixel is very different from one image to the next. The particular light-sensitive cells in your eye that are firing when you see this tree are very different from the ones firing when you see this tree. But something in that crazy smart visual cortex of yours resolves these as representing the same idea, while at the same time recognizing other images as their own distinct ideas. But if I told you, hey, sit down and write for me a program that takes in a grid of 28 by 28 pixels like this and outputs a single number between 0 and 10, telling you what it thinks the digit is, well, the task goes from comically trivial to jauntingly difficult. Unless you've been living under a rock, I think I hardly need to motivate the relevance and importance of machine learning and neural networks to the present and to the future. But what I want to do here is show you what a neural network actually is, assuming no background, and to help visualize what it's doing. Not as a buzzword, but as a piece of math. My hope is just that you come away feeling like the structure itself is motivating, and to feel like you know what it means when you read or you hear about a neural network, quote unquote, learning. This video is just going to be devoted to the structure component of that. And the following one is going to tackle learning. What we're going to do is put together a neural network that can learn to recognize handwritten digits. This is a somewhat classic example for introducing the topic. 
And I'm happy to stick with the status quo here because at the end of the two videos, I want to point you to a couple of good resources mm -hmm. where you can learn more and where you can download the code that does this and play with it on your own computer. There are many, many variants of neural networks, and in recent years, there's been sort of a boom in research towards these variants. But in these two introductory videos, you and I are just going to look at the simplest plain vanilla form with no added frills. This is kind of a necessary prerequisite for understanding any of the more powerful modern variants. And trust me, it still has plenty of complexity for us to wrap our minds around. But even in this simplest form, it can learn to recognize handwritten digits, which is a pretty cool thing for a computer to be able to do. And at the same time, you'll see how it does fall short of a couple of hopes that we might have for it. As the name suggests, neural networks are inspired by the brain. But let's break that down. What are the neurons, and in what sense are they linked together? Right now, when I say neuron, all I want you to think about is a thing that holds a number specifically a number between zero and one. It's really not more than that. For example, the network starts with a bunch of neurons corresponding to each of the 28 times 28 pixels of the input image, which is 784 neurons. Each one of these holds a number that represents the grayscale value of the corresponding pixel, ranging from zero for black pixels up to one for white pixels. This number inside the neuron is called its activation. And the image you might have in mind here is that each neuron is lit up when its activation is a high number. So all of these 784 neurons make up the first layer of our network. Now jumping over to the last layer, this has 10 neurons, each representing one of the digits. The activation in these neurons, again, some number that's between zero and one, represents how much the system thinks that a given image corresponds with a given digit. There's also a couple layers in between called the hidden layers, which for the time being should just be a giant question mark for how on earth this process of recognizing digits is going to be handled. In this network, I chose two hidden layers, each one with 16 neurons. And admittedly, that's kind of an arbitrary choice. To be honest, I chose two layers based on how I want to motivate the structure in just a moment. And 16, well, that was just a nice number to fit on the screen. In practice, there is a lot of room for experiment with the specific structure here. The way the network operates, activations in one layer determine the activations of the next layer. And of course, the heart of the network, as an information processing mechanism, comes down to exactly how those activations from one layer bring about activations in the next layer. It's meant to be loosely analogous to how in biological networks of neurons, some groups of neurons firing cause certain others to fire. Now, the network I'm showing here has already been trained to recognize digits. And let me show you what I mean by that. It means if you heated an image lighting up all 784 neurons of the input layer according to the brightness of each pixel in the image, that pattern of activations causes some very specific pattern in the next layer which causes some pattern in the one after it, which finally gives some pattern in the output layer. And the brightest neuron of that output layer is the network's choice, so to speak, for what it is this image represents. And before jumping into the math for how one layer influences the next. Layer. OK, so that's a <coughs> introductory <coughs> like, little blurb. Just keep in mind, like it's, and I should say, so that first layer, that input layer of neurons, and then the output layer, that's really what we work with, right? We're not worried about the stuff in the middle. And the point that, that the author here is getting to is that the value of each one of those neur neurons basically is a, a number from zero to one, and it's, it's basically optimized by training data, training data, okay? And so you, you basically feed uh, images in, take a picture. You're, imagine a, a photo, slice it into ribbons, align those ribbons on a vector, a long strip, and then slice those into individual pixels. Now, each pixel has three layers, red, green, and blue, right? So you can think about it as a three-dimensional vector of a long strip of pixels from your image. And you feed those one by one, essentially, into this neural network. And then you train it by saying, okay, the actual, by annotating the, the image, like this is a cat. So boom, it's a cat. So that, therefore, you feed it uh, that input and output, and it's like the correct answer is cat. 
And then basically the weighting values of all those neurons are optimized such that the next time you feed it a cat image, unlabeled, it'll shoot through this network and produce cat. That's the same thing that happens with facial recognition. The same thing that happens with a lot of the deep, you heard this talk, concept of deep learning. Same thing happens with deep learning. It's the same thing that happens with the BMP, a satellite imagery example that was referenced. It's the same thing. So it's knowable, right? It's knowable. That, that's the underlying principle. I don't think we need to do much more than that, just to kind of like, it's not, it's, it's not a uh, imaginary thing, <laughs> right? Theoretically, one could do it by hand. But no one's going to do that because no one has the time or attention for that. All right, so that's just a little taste. And by the way, I would recommend, if you're interested in this, this is a great website. It's called Three Blue, One Brown. Really cool math concepts that, um, you know, I just love the stuff because it demystifies a lot of this complicated math. It's understandable. So inputs, outputs, hidden layers, that's the main idea. Okay, let's talk about some examples. And these are examples from my colleagues with USGS and other folks um, you know, across the world. Here's one really neat one. And I hope these will give you a sense for maybe the kinds of watershed conservation or forest conservation or environmental conservation work that you're doing. But I'll give you a, a series of different kind of flavors. Here's an example. Of, again, it's imagery analysis. So photos of streams are basically um, fed into a neural network model with a annotation based on their flow, their flow levels, the stage height of this. And as this changes and you know, water comes up, water goes down, basically you're, you're training this to predict stream flow from images. This is a tool the USGS has developed and it's super important for places like, you know, the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay where we can't estimate stream flow in all these places. It's too expensive. USGS does a great job of this in rivers, but there's a ton of streams out there we care about for brook trout and other things that are just unsampled. Yet, by the way, this summer is very interesting because the drought that we see out here, it, it affected the Potomac Main Stem of course, Washington, D.C. municipal water was panicking, you know. But the streams in some of these places, especially up here in the karst carbonate aquifers, um, go and dry. And so this, these kind of camera-based tools um, but, you know, honestly, it might not take a, a computer to look at dry, right? But, but these kind of camera-based remote tools are cheap, right? You can use a GoPro or a little Bushnell camera for 150 bucks. You can get eyes on the, the resources. And I think, you know, this is super cool for citizens and sort of engagement with participatory science, too. Um, another example, training images to identify harmful algal blooms in, in main stems. Turns out, again, it's, again, think imagery, classification, and prediction. So the imagery here, you can see changes in water clarity um, and the contrast um, that can be used to predict harmful algal blooms. Uh, this is work in the, the Chesapeake, uh, excuse me, the Connecticut River. But it could work anywhere, I think. I think it, you know, that's a big deal for the Shenandoah, for, for real. Um, so put a pin on that one. Here's a really neat example. It's the same thing, uh, per, you know, in principle. But uh, this is work in Africa where uh, a, a researcher at Cornell has developed a system to listen, to basically deploy uh, microphones in, in the savanna, collect sound da data, train a neural network to classify Elephants versus poachers, and it works. So all of a sudden, you've got just a couple of microphones out there pinging up to a website, and all of a sudden, you can, you can track your poachers. I'm pretty amazing. Now, I mentioned that imagery was more conducive than sound data, because you think about sound data being like, you know, sound waves and stuff. Turns out that pictures are easier for neural networks to, to operate on. So the, the sound wave data are converted to an image, and that image, once again, take that pixel, take that photo, JPEG, slice it into ribbons conceptually, right? Slice it into ribbons, line them up, and then shoot those into a neural network. So basically, this, the computer is analyzing the imagery. It's not analyzing the sound data, but it, it creates inferences from the sound data. So that's an example of conservation uh, for you know, large mammals in Africa from these methods. 
Uh, folks here are familiar with, with this, right? Everybody's got Merlin on their phone. Is that people are familiar with that? Yeah. That's a game changer. Isn't that the coolest thing? I mean, because it's real time, but under the hood, how does this work? It works from training a neural network model, identifying, classifying bird at species X, Y, and Z, and then picking up the sound data. The sound data converted to imagery, the imagery converted to a prediction, and then boom, you get, okay, this is a cardinal, this is whatever. So that's under the hood what's happening. So I think there's a lot of creative space for, um, you know, taking this kind of approach. You know, Cornell Lab has nailed it for bird research. This, this is, it's been done and it's awesome. But maybe there are other ways for us to apply these tools in the space that you guys are working in. Um, here's a big focus of the work that we're doing and this is sort of a revolution. You know, it's not, from sound, it's from images. So there are all sorts of tools out there right now to identify species from images. Okay, so in this under the hood, same deal, neural networks. Uh, Microsoft AI for Earth is a, is a great platform for this. And I'll show you some other platforms. Um, this is a game changer, right? So we can identify species. And there are so many different apps out there. It's sort of like a blizzard of app, like what are we getting? But <coughs> they're really, a lot of them are trained on the same thing scraped data from the web, right? That's kind of what it is. And that, put a pin in that because the inherent biases that go into what's on, online produce biases on the output, right? So we have to understand that. But species classification, uh, for example, you know, you get a photo and you get a probability score. So, you know, it's a cat. Um, and it gives you a probability score. And those are essentially the values of those neurons on the output layer, right? What's the probability? This is a cat with 97.62% probability. The other options, it could be a possum, but 0.5%, you know, whatever. And so you can, that's, that's how to interpret this. So Microsoft's AI for Earth for species ID. It's great. It's free. It's available. This is another big one. And this, folks familiar with this app? See? All right. So this is a game changer. It's under the hood, the same thing. And another cool thing about this is it builds community <coughs> of participants. So you can think about like a Venn diagram, you know, where like tech, technical capacities on one is one circle and, and maybe social networks is another circle. And a third circle would be a conservation impact. That's how I think we could be thinking about the, these tools, right? So technological capacity, social network building community and and then conservation impact how, how do those things align right? so the big game changer here um seek and i love that the, the community aspect of that is super huge but it's not just seek you know this is everywhere you look uh get on the you know app store and you picture this really great plant uh tool again same thing annotated imagery data to provide that in the fish world where I'm working, uh, Fish Verify is another tool for this. It, and here's another way to think about these, the, the utility for community is that um, these things will provide additional um, value to the participants, the users. In this case, the additional value is, you know, you upload a photo of a fish that you've caught. Okay, this is, you know, a snap, like a red snap. Or boom, you get a species ID, which you know, kind of new. But then you also it harvests regional environmental data. So the NOAA buoys, it'll interpolate multiple buoys and give you a say, okay, this is the salinity for your location. This is the tidal condition. And so anglers love this stuff because they're too lazy to do a, a log book of our fishing log book, but we want to know conditions, right? And so you know, I, I'm super interested in the idea of like, okay, from a conservation perspective, how could you use this? Um, you know, there's there's a lot. I, mean, I want to get into a brainstorm session because I think that's a big space um, for all, all the work you're doing. Okay, so that was species ID, but now let's take it to the next level. And this is the project that I'm developing. This is a individual ID. So with species ID, that problem has been solved. Those, we've done that. Here's the frontier. It's individual for wildlife, wildlife, 
individual ID. It's the same principle, neural network, trained on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, individuals. Wildme.org is a great uh, organization They're based out of Portland, uh, Oregon, and they're leading the way on these platforms. You can see that they're, they're you know, all sorts of different uh, packages and social networks here. They've done work with, you know, sea dragons and spotted uh, whale, whale sharks and manta rays and you name it, zebras, it's amazing. It turns out that animals often have unique markings <laughs> that you can see. It doesn't always work for all taxa, but for, for many of these species, it has in individual markings. That's what you need. And with individual ID, you can do things, and this is where my main research kicks in, is that you can do things like estimate abundance. You can't do that with uh, species IDs because obviously individuals are necessary to mark recapture, to think about, are you counting the same individual twice, blah, blah, blah. So that's a frontier of, of um, where things are going in these platforms. So wildme.org, great resource there. So let me, let me talk about this uh, project we're developing with uh, Trout Unlimited and Wild Me. And I want to encourage you to check it out. Now we're going to launch this this winter. It'll be available next spring in the Chesapeake Bay region, free. Anybody's welcome to participate. Um, so we need you know, anglers and citizen science groups. Uh, we need nonprofits, or, watershed organizations, spread the word, et cetera, et cetera. But let me give you an overview of what this is about. Brook trout, I mean, a state fish for West Virginia, climate change, canary in the coal mine, uh, an indicator of environmental quality, culturally super important fish, economically super important fish, big conservation priority, blah, blah, blah. Turns out that the pigmentation patterns are individually diagnostic, individually diagnostic. And you can ask Sarah about the pigmentation patterns uh, from an ecological perspective, Sarah's from Penn State and does really cool work on that. But our application is this. It turns out that those are thumbprints. Okay, those are those are essentially individual markings, and we can they're natural markings. We can use those for uh, you know population modeling, demographic modeling. So how do we automate? Because <laughs> some anglers have been trying to do this for years, right? You know, hardcore kind of take picture. Yeah, they look at me, circle the dots, you know, and like, okay, cool. But that's a huge amount of effort. Let's automate it and just make it free and available to everybody. So individually diagnostic pigmentation, here's the here's the vision. We we want to um, expand conservation stewardship and conservation ethics. We want to build big data for trend analysis, right? So the partnership works like this. Trout Unlimited has a ginormous social network, hundreds of thousands of committed, hardcore, some might say obsessive anglers. Let's not recreate a social network. They have it, right? And they have chapters and all this stuff. Well, I think there are watershed organizations in this room and others, you know, that are, that are uh, able to step up and, and participate here. And so, with that kind of social network outreach, anglers go to their favorite streams. They set up a, a platform uh, and they submit images through Wild Me's um, online platform. Then deep learning is another just kind of jargon, but it's basically a neural network. So we train this neural network based on individual pigmentation patterns. And I should say that our, our uh, preliminary work with USGS and the University of Virginia and computer scientists, this is actually where the computer science muscle comes in. Like, Collaboration is important. We've seen that there's over 95% uh, accuracy in individual ID, re-ID. That's one thing with Brook Trail. So we're confident that this will this will work. Um, the other thing is that we're also confident Brook Trout are not a, a long-lived species, right? So to get recaptures or to have any kind of like feedback, you got to get multiple observations within about a three-year period, right? From <laughs> A, a three-year-old brook trout is kind of an old brook trout. <laughs> so it's not like you have an unlimited time to kind of do this. Um, but we, we've done this work with brook trout, seasonal, uh, detecting individuals across seasons, high confidence. We've also looked at this with Masu salmon in uh, the northern uh, island in, in Japan, Hokkaido Island, Hokkaido University. They've collected hundreds of thousands of images, and we've put those to use, high confidence, they're individually diagnostic, and those marks are observable across seasons, right? So 
proof of concept is there, but this this is not new. This is new. We haven't put this to work. But the idea is okay. You get neural networks. Boom. You get from that. You build out a uh, estimates of abundance and ideally trends. You know we care about these places. And I should say, our other work with USGS, we're doing we're collaborating with Park Service in places like Shenandoah National Park. These like last best places for cold water fisheries. You know the places that are still intact forests in the Chesapeake Bay. We have some unfortunate news to share. Uh, you know, and I, I've got to like tap the brakes here until this is. Published, but I'll tell you preliminarily what we're, what we're seeing is that watersheds that are small, relatively small, and at low elevations in Shenandoah National Park showed significant declines in brook trout abundance over the last 40 years. That's really crazy because the species has been here for millions of years, right? 40 years, we see significant declines in small watersheds at low elevations, and the, the kind of smoking gun there is the low elevation sites are warmer, air temperatures hot, right? So we have some work to do to sort that out, but that's really scary. It's happening in our lifetime. The other thing is there's actually some good news story from Shenandoah where watersheds that are sensitive to acid deposition, the ones that are unbuffered geologically, right? The ones that lack calcium and, and magnesium so that they're sensitive to acid deposition. Those ones seem to be rebounding over time. And that to me, I, you know, we have work to do here, but it looks like that's a win for the Clean Air Act. That's what it suggests. So just, you know, Put a pin in that because that, that's important. So back to this. So what we're doing is creating a feedback loop where we have this social, we build social networks, we build these communities. So every time you know, you're participating in this, you submit a fish image. When that fish is recaptured, you get an email. Hey, guess what? You know, we saw George. <laughs> we think that's going to be, I think anglers are going to love this because you know, it deepens your, your connection to the resource and the place. You know, and it kind of like, I think it's going to be cool. We're not going to share that publicly because anglers, you know, are weird. They were simultaneously like super show offy and super secretive. Weird. It's a weird combo, right? You, but you, you have to be careful when we're not going to be spot burning. No, no public information is going to go out. But if you submit an image from a place, keep in mind, all you do is enable location services on your phone. And then there'll be a lat long coordinate tag the metadata for that image. So if you look at your iPhone or whatever, you take a photo, if, if location services are enabled, kind of scroll it down and you'll see a uh, lat long, okay? So it's easy, it's easy to, to do. And that's the feedback loop, right? Um, the USGS point component is really here in the fish population dynamics. I mean, Department of the Interior, we, we can't do public, we talk a big game about you know participatory science, and engaging the public and such, but I don't, you know, we don't do it very well, in my opinion, because there are all sorts of hurdles, but nonprofit organizations can do it. Build your membership. That's the partnership that we're interested in. Okay. All right. So let me just uh, show you a little gut check. <laughs> Is this going to work? These are just massive salmon from Hokkaido. And guess what? It, you, you know, visually, you can kind of see, all right. I, I can track this individual. So you can see these are uh, centimeter squared grids. So we can actually kind of have a rough estimate of, of growth. But if you can track this individual, for example, you can kind of see the pattern. If we can see it, a neural network model can definitely see it, right? But you can see how, okay, that kind of tracks. And then, if, then this individual, a few spots, it kind of tracks. Now, interestingly, you know, as, as these fish develop, it, they start with par marks, big oval shape marks. And then as they mature, usually you, you see the, the genesis of, of pigment, sort of spot pigmentation over that. And then sort of it's like a, a layer cake, right? It's like multiple layers. Well, using image processing, you can kind of strip those off. And there's like different levels of, of sort of information that are nested in the, the physical pigmentation. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So, um, you know, first step is we extract par marks. So let's just, and we're not even looking at spots. We're just looking at par marks. Oh, it's like not a big deal. Um, and then we put them in a matrix here. And basically, the way to think about this is how accurate are your re identification? Here's time period one, here's time period two. And you can see that the, the, the central stripe here is you know, well over, um, it, it's over 90% accuracy versus all the other random. So basically, we can get these individuals, we can track them over time. 
And we can see separation among it. You've got to randomize this, send uh, send this model, you know, run this model a hundred times. You can see separation. So I, I can motivate that the sort of the structure of this thing is going to work conceptually, but we have to build the social networks to implement. But here's how it might play out in a place like Shenandoah, uh, you know, from a kind of you know example of one watershed here. Um, we're going to be defining um, sort of grain, uh, spatial grain for, for sampling. Think about, consider these traps. You know, these anglers out there, the lat long coordinates, you think about fish movement activity areas, and there's a probability of a detection or non detection in that location. We can build an, a, a matrix of encounters, uh, individual fish as rows, and sort of traps or uh, essentially like locations on the landscape. We build these through time. And you can use, uh, you know, established mark recapture techniques. I'm not going to go into it, but you know, uh, the sort of wildlife biology techniques to estimate abundance. So that is the vision. Now, there also are, to put it out there, there also are some uncertainties, right? Some, <laughs> something. There's difficulties too, because you know, one angler versus another, huge difference on whether you're not going to catch this fish. So just because you have an angler out there doesn't mean that you're not, not seeing an individual is it's truly absent. No. So there's angler effort, there's angler skill, there's different differences in gear type. These are all what we're gonna use as covariates in this, in this model. We're gonna build a model to account for those effects, um, you know, in a mixed modeling framework. So I think, you know, we have a good, good chance of, of doing what we care about, which is estimating uh, abundance from these tools. So now I wanted to switch gears a little bit. And, you know, some folks here who used GPT-4, uh, other folks haven't. I just wanted to show you a couple of things and maybe kind of end up with some cautionary tales and then we'll hopefully have some time for um, discussion. Just pop on to which. So. Okay. So this is um, one of many, many, well, not many, many. There, there's like, I don't know, four or five big ones right now, the sort of chat functions that people are using. Um, now I wanted to start with this. This is a chat, and this is the Google Bard, right? Google Bard is a um, widely used chat function. And I wanted to show you some things that might be useful for you. So one of the key challenges here is, and again, this is not a model that I have trained with anything. This is just what's available on the web right now. Just Anybody can access it. Um, let's do this. Uh, I want to. So the, the game changer here is imagery, right? So let's drop this little image in here, just like on a random thing, and uh, ask it a question. It is. And I fed it something, uh, you know, something I grabbed off Google Images, whatever. Let's see what it has to say. Oh, this species is a rainbow trout. And that is correct. <laughs> rainbow trout, blah, 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 blah. These are the other, could be, but less likely. Again, think about that neural network. There's a probability of this species being like over 90%, and the other ones are less probable. It feeds that information back. Coastal cut, these are, okay, I am confident. And then this is, <laughs> I love you, computer. You are correct. Now, I'm glad you're here. Okay, so now let's let's challenge this thing a little bit. Let's challenge this thing. Now, this I'm going to show you what this looks like. Um, this species is uh, an undescribed species of, of, of sculpin. Cotus is the genus. It, it's checkered sculpin, endemic to the Chesapeake Bay, the headwaters of the Potomac. Um, endemic to the Chesapeake Bay and a cold water specialist. I think this is going to be a really important indicator species for climate change. We've done some work on this, and if you ping me later, I can I can send you the papers that look at this. But um, super important species, checkered skull. Yeah, question. Sorry, just real quick. Yeah. But the first image you fed was from Google, and this is Google's bard. Correct. And That's this great... image you took. Yourself? No, I also scraped this one off off the web too. Okay. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Because I'm gonna ask this. 
what is this species? I'm not even saying fish. We're saying, what is this species? So you're drawn to the right point there. And, and let me see. Well, who knows what will happen? There. But these are both from Google image searches, mm -hmm. right? So, ah, dang, look at that. This is a sculpin. Possibly a modeled sculpin or a slimy. This bared eye should have two eyes. Yeah. Slimy, correct? <laughs> OK, OK, that's not bad. That's not bad. I'm most confident is a model or a slimy sculpin. That's not bad. Now, I didn't get checkered because if the imagery, the amount of data that's online that's labeled with checkered sculpin. Now, this is labeled as checkered sculpin online. But let's put it this way. The amount of labeled data that says rainbow trout is piled up that high. It's the most commonly, you know, we, we, it's the most widely uh, stocked fish in the world. And the amount of labeled data on checkered sculpin alone. And that's the reason that the confidence is different. Um, let's do this. Let's do this guy. This is also a, um, well, let's see. All right, we'll put that so the point is this the, the, the training data going in, the bigger the training data, the more confident the predictions, right? And obviously, you know, the web is not an unbiased tool, it's totally biased. You know, Eurocentric, white, it's totally biased, ma it was, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly, the training data are totally biased. Who has the money to put things online? That's the, that's the answers that you get on the other side of the pipeline. So just, I think it's important just to keep that in mind. Uh, it's relevant for wildlife. I think it's more relevant for, for um, people. Okay, now here's something else. And this is a, this is a, a change of pace. But I want, I want to show you this just in case it would be useful. All right, so who here writes grant proposals? <laughs> okay, well, this is something to watch. And I think the same principle applies not just for proposal writing, but check this out. This is what you, how you would use Read this RFP. And feed it. This is NIFWIF uh, Central Axe program. Great program. Just read this and read this, and you just feed it a URL, right? And you know, let's see. I have read that thing. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, look at this. The program has two primary goals. The proposal. Oops, uh, conservation. And <coughs> Introduction. Okay, we're looking at this blah, 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 blah. You can save these. Okay. <laughs> Here's one to be careful about. Humans should be the ones having the objectives. <laughs> okay. Like, okay, oh, it's so easy to do this now. We're like, okay, here's my thing. What I'm going to do. Oh, I guess my objective is to do this, this, and this. My timeline is this, this, this. My budget. Okay, how about this? Um, write a detailed budget. Raise twenty five percent indirect cost, and what? What is any suggestions? Yeah, travel budget and travel costs. And printing. And printing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So look. <laughs> well, it's. <a laughs> All right, export it to Sheets. I'm just saying it's not garbage, right? It's not garbage. It has that utility. Um, and, you know, there are other tools out here to look for, you know, who's plagiarizing what. You know, things like that. But I've heard some from some program managers that, that have said, I would rather have a chat bot write it so it's succinct than have someone else write it that's not succinct. And maybe that's okay. I don't know. This is obviously a totally different space for <laughs> like how you can use these tools in, in your work. Um, but it's a real space, and I mean, look, you know, just look forward a couple of years. I don't think there's any question that this is going to be the main thing. The challenge, of course, I think we all got to take this to heart, is that the objectives aren't given to us. We give the objectives. Okay. 
and we give you objectives. And then this is a tool to get those objectives. So, all right, let me end with this um, concept. Just a couple of cautionary tales. Uh, and then we will just uh, have a discussion of whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, all, right. <laughs> all right, so I don't know if it's legible, but I'm like, hey, we had a discussion, show me the research on this and that. And I'm like, okay, boom. Uh, here are blah, 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 some things. I'm like, well, give me, and I say here, it's not legible, but give me some citations for the papers that you reference, right? Okay. Well, they look good to me. Look, Transactions as American Fishery Society, a good journal, legit journal. Northeastern Naturalist, a real journal. But guess what? They do not exist. This was fabricated out of maybe whole cloth. I don't know. My suspicion is that these were papers that had been submitted and maybe had an online fingerprint, but were never published for whatever reason. Maybe I did scientific dirty laundry. I don't know. My point is this caution, caution. These, it does not exist. And if we're just going to accept it as truth, we're way off base. Yeah. So, like, it said data, it, it reads all of this data. Yeah. Can it make up stuff? Isn't that like a, is that made up? Or it, do you think that is from, like, I don't know. I don't know if it's made up out of, I don't know if it's fabricated or if it, there's a digital fingerprint somewhere out there. It was like reviewed. And you know, maybe in a wiley.com or whatever, but get never published. Ideas, yeah. Yeah, I think it is fabricated because basically, um, and again, I'm pretty sure I'm wrong, it it learns the patterns in language, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like if you ask someone to come up with a fake journal title, it's like, oh, these are plausible names, uh -huh. it's all plausible. So yeah, I, yeah. I, that's, that's interesting. So the idea of like large language models. These are based on neural networks, but the whole game is just to predict the next word. Based on that sequence of words, predict the like, most likely next word. And so anyway, I'm just like, the caution, these do not exist. And the other cautionary piece is, there is racial and gender bias in AI tools. Um, it's, you know, it's been shown in many ways, and we gotta be careful about this. We can't accept these things as inherent truth. Um, you know, again, in a wildlife and conservation context, maybe that's not as much of a concern, but I, I think it has to be on, on the table. Also, as police forces are, and others are using, again, neural networks, individual ID, same thing, we see bias showing up in places like New Orleans, uh, you know, police department and other places. So just, you know, heads up on, on, on the potential pitfalls. So let me leave you with a couple of really cool uh, resources. And this is the one I want to highlight. If you want to tap into the conservation tech stuff in the AI space or in others, go here. These guys are awesome. Wildlabs.net. They are fantastic. It's a global network of people that are doing, you know, AI, camera trapping, tech, but really with eyes on um, social justice, on, um, you know, building community, and on really innovative conservation work. So I, I'm super impressed with them. Microsoft AI for Earth, very cool tools there. Uh, Hugging Chat is another thing. It's kind of weirdly named, but whatever. That's an open source AI chat system, kind of like Bard and you know all that. But it's but it's open source. So if you you I like that because all of a sudden you can get on a GitHub and not that I could interpret it, but one can see the underlying mechanism. So it's more transparent. That's really important. Uh, and let me leave you with this other thought: um, is that uh, I think one of the big promises, I mean, we, you know, like there's bias in these systems and there's, you know, profiling and it can be cyborg, you know, and there are all sorts of doomsday scenarios. And those are, I think they're real. I also see an opportunity for some radical leveling of the playing field. I mean, how many of, uh, you know, small watershed, or I don't have to tell you all, but small organizations now can compete with the big dogs. <laughs> Because now all of a sudden you don't necessarily have to have a dedicated staffer to do the grantsmanship and all that. You can crank, you can compete in a smarter way with some of these tools. I think you also can think about, you know, developing innovative strategies that, you know, harnessing what's already there can level the playing field for watershed organizations in a new way. I think that is the that's to me, in my mind, kind of the real cool part, the opportunity that's out there. Um, 
and you know that's the space where groups in the Chesapeake can um, build community. Think about that. There's the Venn, Venn diagram: technological innovation, right? Um, community building, conservation impact. That's what how these things come together. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for your time and attention. I'd love to hear any other thoughts you guys have. Yeah. So it was very fast. Um, there's a bit, there's, I guess, in my opinion, or partially personal, partially professional opinion, is there's not very good abundance of uh, estimates of striped bass in Chesapeake Bay because it was around and, you know, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is working on it for a long time, but we don't really have good numbers of that. So, is it possible to use this tool for straight bass? Are they, do the individuals have the markings and? It's untested. It's a great idea. It's a great idea not to, to evaluate that. What we would need, we need training data. Yeah. So for DNR, or Aaron, I can follow up with you on this because I, I love that idea. I think if we could combine it with their survey data, we have to have verified individual IDs. That's right. the real trick. Yeah. You have to have a confirmation. This is a different individual. But yet, you know, they, DNR does uh, mark and capture work. Right. Anglers are putting in tags and stuff. So maybe there's that. I suspect that the, there's less there's less pigmentation on a striped bass than there is on a brook trout. Right. The spot patterns really you imagine as a thumbprint. But I've been wrong about this kind of thing before. I mean, you, we could use par marks on Massey Salmon. They're just a couple of circles. Well, striped bass and then the broken line. Maybe that's individual diagnosis, so I'd like to follow up. Yeah. Okay, let's talk. Yeah, cool. Yes, sir. So it's on uh, wild meat, trout spotter, and just like the servers themselves that hold like these large neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of, re uh, a bit of research came out earlier this year that was talking about like how much water is needed to keep these oh. servers cool and running and how that is an environmental problem in of itself. So I was wondering if, there's been any research to make these neural networks that are being used for conservation more sustainable That's themselves. Great. Other folks might have more info than I do on that front. I think it's a great concern. I mean, data centers and such, this is a real impact. It's a climate impact on, now there, there you know how it is, uh, computer scientists will talk about um, quantum computing. I believe when I see it mm -hmm. as a theory, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> but you know, also uh, Microsoft AI for uh, Earth has, they're, they're attempting to address that by having what they call their planetary engine, which, yeah, again, I'll believe it when I see it. Does it really reduce carbon emissions? I don't know, but that concern is legit. Yeah. Um, this is probably an obvious question, but uh, you know, thinking about your the AI with the truck trout, you know, so we find George. Um, can we combine that information with other information like water quality information? Um, can we figure out, can we say, you know, we, we have evidence that, that brook trout are occupying these different areas and, and then correlate that potentially with water quality? Uh, you know what, this is a great idea. That's not on our agenda for version 1.0, but there are ways to do it. The challenge, I think, is that. When we interpolate from USGS river gauges, or we interpolate from like air, air temperature models or JMAT or whatever, like the available data at the gigs, it breaks apart from the fine scale. You know, our river conditions are great in rivers, but when we try to estimate those upslope, it fragments out. And so I don't, I don't really trust that. So it's a challenge, but I think there maybe are some things that we can think more about. I mean, what can you get from an image? You probably get water clarity, but if you get habitat quality. Take a photo of the bank, take a photo of the fish. You know, we kind of know from brook trout, it's it's like they are only in the prettiest places in the last best, you know, I'm biased, right? But they don't they don't put up with uh, trash habitat. So we kind of have a sense for that, but there's there's much more that can be done in that regard. And I guess where I'd go to is thinking about okay, photo of the fish, photo of the habitat. Maybe that's the next step, because that's easily doable. But I don't really trust our flow estimates for these headwater streams because it has too fragmented, too patchy. Yeah. Yeah. Even for temperature, because localized groundwater, surface water interactions can be super patchy. So it creates like a research challenge, but I'll keep thinking about it. <coughs>
Let's time everybody. Let's definitely give them a round here. Jesse will give you some tickets uh, for the raffle tonight on the way out. So thanks so much. Oh, I want to talk more. And I'm with the uh, Calvert. Uh, excuse me, the uh, the conservation department here, county government. Oh, cool. Uh, the, well, I'd like